Our next speaker uh, arriving now on the stage is Peter Grant, MP, followed by Mary Finlayson of Inverkey. Then, welcome, Peter. Thanks very much, Kirsten. You know, a, a lot of people would think that my next move should be to volunteer for the idea of standing SNP candidates in English constituencies, because apparently the rules of that place down there are that should a sitting MP decide they don't want to be an MP anymore, just hypothetically speaking, if they stand in an unwinnable seat and get humped, they get more of a payoff than if they just retire gracefully like I was planning to do. The only difficulty, the only difficulty with that is that if the messages that we get every day from people and organisations in England or anything they go by, any of you are thinking of standing for an English seat, be careful, you might win. But it, it seems to me that I genuinely feel that we are turning a corner today. We've had some bad, bad times recently uh, that we don't need to dwell on. But I think there is a, a broad consensus emerging about what we need to do. There's three things that we've got to take on over the next few months. First of all, we've got to be on the doorsteps every minute of every day that we can to persuade as many people as possible to vote SNP at the next election whenever that comes. Second, we need to make sure that the message that we put in our manifesto and in the ballot paper has got to be so unequivocal that even the British government can't ignore it. A vote for the SNP, a majority for the SNP, is an independence vote in Scotland. And yes, we should be asking the other independence parties to put it on the manifestos. We should all be putting it explicitly on the ballot paper. SNP, Scottish National Party for an independent Scotland. Scottish Green Party for an independent Scotland. Alba Party for an independent Scotland. All the rest, so that people know they are literally voting. So that people know they are literally voting not for a referendum, they are voting explicitly for an independent Scotland. That won't immediately change the minds or hearts of those that we eventually have to negotiate with. But I tell you something, it will make a huge difference to the reception that we get when the Scottish Government starts to reach out to the European Union. And by the way, not just the European Union, we should be looking for special observer status or whatever other organisations will provide at the United Nations, at OSCE, at the Council of Europe. Those people are our friends now a lot more than they will be the friends of the United Kingdom Government that is seeking to negotiate with us. For the first time in our history, we've got a chance to be negotiating from a position of strength with the vast majority of other world world democracies on our side, not on theirs. If the British government think they can stop us from gaining independence by a way of their choosing, we are going to say to them, OK, we will take it back right now by a method and at a time when in terms of our choosing, not yours. Thank you very much, Peter. I'd like to call to the stage now Mary Finlayson from Inverkeething branch, who will be followed by Ian Murray, not that one, from Falkirk South branch. If either of them are in the hall, please come forward. And the next person I would then be seeking to call is Joe Hughes from South Ayrshire. Struggling to see you all again. Welcome to Ian Murray of Falkirk South Branch. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't usually get the opportunity to speak because I'm always stewarded at conference, so we're not allowed to talk to anybody then. But uh, I've uh, got a, a, an off the plan, an off the cuff plan that I'd like. We was promised a, a referendum in October this year, and I would really love for the Scottish Parliament to organise a vote for the Scottish people to declare their confidence or no confidence in the Westminster government. Let's just see if that would work with anybody. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. I'd now like to call Chris Hanlon of West Fife and Coastal Villages branch to be followed by Nora Miller of Bridgehead branch. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, friends. Facebook recently reminded me that six years ago I was a, a, 
and I went to Edinburgh, where something Keith Brown said pretty much changed my life. It was at the deputy leader hustings, and uh, I had asked him, what can we do to hold you to account if all the promises you're making here turn out to be worth less than the paper they're printed on? And he turned to me and he said, well, come October at conference, you can stand against me. And uh, fortunately, I've not had to do that yet. He's doing a pretty good job. One of the strengths of the Scottish National Party is that it's members that make policy. It's you that decide policy. And I was fortunate to be elected to the NEC a couple of years ago as a policy development committee. I had a, a fantastic time helping members across the country pass some absolutely amazing policies. And uh, earlier this year, I was very concerned when the NEC delayed and essentially cancelled this conference, the special conference. And so I went to one of the hustings to speak to the candidates, to look them in the eye and say to them, look, you know, it's not the job of the leader to decide policy, it's the job of the leader to implement policy. All of party policy and nothing but party policy. Because I was concerned I was going to have to do the same thing to one of them later on. And much like uh, Peter and Tommy, I'm very pleased with what I've heard here today that I'm not going to have to do something like that in October. But this looks like we are heading in the right direction. But what I really want to say is that I've heard a lot of nuanced, technical, detailed opinions about exactly how we go about running an independence election. And I think it's important that whatever consensus comes over the summer through the regional assemblies and actually listening and working with individual members and branches to come to a consensus that the resolutions that come to conference in October come from the grassroots. They don't come down from the NEC. They don't come down from Scottish Parliament ministers. They come up. They come up in the names of branches so that we know in October when we're voting for the specific details of how we put an end to the union, that it's your decision that we're voting for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. I'd now like to call Nora Miller from Bridgehead branch. Do we have Nora in the room? And following Nora, I was going to call Councillor Martin Shepherd from Arbroath. Um, is Martin in the room? Well, he is, and I think he's moving towards us at a good speed. Thanks, Martin. And following Martin, I'm going to be calling Sharon Trish from Strathair. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to come up today because I know we're all on the journey to independence together. And a reminder that it's, there's been a lot of focus on getting more facts and figures, and that is a big part of it. But is someone really going to be persuaded by telling them your state pension is going to be X a month? I don't really think so. You know, I joined the party because when I watched the news <laughs> when I was younger going through, I could clearly see that the UK politicians, Westminster, were not serving and did not have Scotland's best interests at heart. And to that, what I want to tell them is, and I keep telling people through conversations I have daily, you know, not SNP people, work colleagues, friends, family that aren't convinced yet, I tell them about broken promises in the referendum big investment promised to uh, Peter Head, carbon, carbon caption, didn't happen. Um, MPs, when's the last time you saw all the Labour MPs coming up on a train to Scotland? I've not seen any since 2014. Why? Because real power was on the table and that's why Westminster wanted to put us in our box, to deny us the real power. I'm 36 years old. And only one day in my lifetime have I been sovereign, the 18th of September, 2014. And everyone today, I can't exactly tell you the exact road to independence, 
but I know that we're not going in our box and no one is going to put us in our box. And to that, it's not just about facts and figures. I don't think that'll win us the day. What will is shining the light on every single thing that Westminster does to hurt the people of Scotland. So on that note, each and every one of you tell your individual story of why you joined the party and why you want independence and the wrongs that Westminster do. And keep telling them, it's amazing the amount of people that do not know. So tell them the wrongs of Westminster. We'll get there, we'll get there everyone. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker I'm looking to call to the stage is Sharon Trish of Strathern Branch. Do we have Sharon with us? She had to go out. Oh, well, I'm sorry to have missed Sharon. Um, can we call to the stage Kayser Habib of Dundee West Branch to be followed by Councillor Lloyd Melville of Moneyfeath Branch? Is that his mum? <laughs> Welcome. Very good afternoon, brave Scotland. Thank you very much, Christine, for giving me this opportunity to talk. I'm a Kaiser Habib. The people know me by Kaiser Chief, <laughs> Kaiser Susie. So these words, people remember me like that. I'm the convener from the Dundee West Branch, and Dundee is a city of discovery. We had very good discussion, talks, and uh, nice speeches, but I'm here to tell you my own personal experience. Being a Asian, proudly Asian Scot, when I wake up in the morning, what I do, putting up the right people on the right place, like that. When I wake up in the morning, I look at my wee boys, and I ask them, stronger for? And they say, Daddy, Scotland! So this is the reminder we have to start from our own families, from our own doorstep. And I can assure you, uh, Keith Brown and SNP, the ethnic minorities are working shoulder to shoulder with you until we get the independent Scotland. I'm not here to talk, no speeches. I know it's so hot, but your energy. I'm very confident today, very energetic after the Hamza speech. I'm more enthusiastic, but with the support of you. How? If my, can, my son can say, Daddy, stronger for Scotland, why not you? So no, so no, so no, this is a time in Dundee. Just to make a witness of these walls, this media, and you can tell, make a witness. We went to the Dundee for the convocation, and then the witnesses are there. I'm gonna say stronger for, stronger for, and everybody from here, from here, for Scotland, have to say loudly Scotland. So stronger for, Lord, these are not the witnesses. SNP bosses are here. We need to tell some other guys, you know what I'm talking about. We need to tell them we have decided there's no other way until Scotland. Stronger for? Stronger for? I cannot hear from there. I cannot hear from this side. Kirsten, I need to hear you now. So stronger for! Stronger for! No, you 
you can hear me only stronger for scholar thank you very much i'm now going to call to the stage sharon trish to be followed by lloyd melville I think Sharon has made her way very fast to be back here with us. So thank you and welcome to the stage. Oops. I almost gave up. I was going out the door to get some water, so I'm sorry. And there were so many things I wanted to say. Um, I guess I was talking to an SNP member a couple of weeks ago, and she said, how are we supposed to know this stuff? And it was things that I know because I'm involved in the Yes Movement, I'm involved in the National Yes Network, I'm involved in Believe in Scotland, and I'm involved in SMP. It's my life. So more and more, we need to get involved on the local level. And we can't expect people to do it for us. Somebody said, we were supposed to have a day of action. What's going on? Well, go and ask. Go and get involved. And we need to do this on the local level first and get involved with our, if there's a yes group near you, as Gordon talked about this morning, if it's an affiliated Believe in Scotland group, get involved with them. We have to start crossing our own borders that the party isn't all, and the yes movement needs all of you to be involved in that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that I'm sensing, and I think somebody just said it, a sea change in the party, in the leadership. I'm very, very impressed with Hamza as our first minister. Absolutely. And I think we all need to get behind him because we're hearing a lot of grumbling. I have no time for that grumbling. I'm too in, I'm, I wanna be positive. People who don't know are saying things about him, about the government, about ministers, about stuff they don't know and we're falling for it. So we got to stop listening to that. My husband is notorious for getting online and arguing with people within the movement, and it's going nowhere. I think we have to get to the positive part, talk to people locally, and do something that is productive rather than complaining about stuff that has nothing to do with reality. So thank you for this. Thanks, thank, this has been brilliant having all the punchers up here, you know, an occasional pol politician. But the, we need to be doing this more often. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon. And our final speaker of this session, and we have fitted a lot of speakers into this session. So before I, I call Lloyd, uh, I, I'd like to thank all of you who put cards in um, and all of you who got up to speak because it has been fantastic to hear what you've all had to say. So the last word goes to Councillor Lloyd Melville. Money fee. Thank you, friends. We now have a proposed process, which I am very pleased to back wholeheartedly. But independence, as we know, is so much more than process. Because the people of Scotland overwhelmingly agree with our diagnosis of the problem. And our diagnosis is that Britain is utterly, fundamentally, and irretrievably broken. And Speaking as I do to my constituents in Monifith and Sidlow, many, many people share that view and are willing to listen. And what we need to do now, between now and the election, is to turn that willingness to listen into support for the remedy. And that remedy is independence. And having listened to the First Minister, I am more certain than ever that we can and we will. Because Westminster policies are causing real damage in our communities, pushing children into poverty, punishing the most vulnerable, demonizing those fleeing war, sanctioning the poorest, and plundering our energy resources to fund tax freezes for England. And I say to the Labour Party, if they really want to look us in the eye, the people of Scotland in the eye, and say this is as good as it gets, bring it on. But our campaign cannot be just about how bad Westminster is, although we know it is bad. It's got to be about the good work we do here in Scotland and our Scottish Government, led by our fantastic new First Minister, Hamza Youssef, 
is doing. And I can speak to that because kids in my ward will be getting a transformational new high school thanks to partnership with the Scottish Government. And that is a testament to what we can do when we align vision and investment. And that's something we can do a lot more of with independence. I just want to close by saying times are tough just now and our opponents are underestimating us and they think we are down and out. In the words of a hero of mine, every accomplishment starts with the decision to try. None of us here should be giving up. We should all be trying our hardest so that we can achieve independence. So let's get out there and win. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. I know you'll all be looking forward to our next speaker, as I am, so I am delighted to welcome to the stage our Deputy Westminster Leader, Mary Black MP. Thank you, thanks everybody. It's always good to get a standing ovation before you speak, isn't it? <laughs> and I, I'm very conscious that my colleagues before me have told everybody the last time that they were in this room, so I feel like I need to share with you. I think it was the singing kettle in 1997. <laughs> now, now, I just want to start by saying a genuine thanks to everybody here, not just for all the hard work that you do, but for making the journey out here in the heat, as I can see all these folk fanning themselves uh, from underneath these lights. So I want to thank you for coming to speak about Scotland's future. And I would love to start off talking to you about something positive, but truthfully, for a lot of people right now, it's hard to see many positives. We have a UK government passing some of the cruelest legislation we've seen in a long, long time. A UK government that will happily break international law, that deems some of the most vulnerable people fleeing war and persecution as illegal, as though any human being could ever be illegal. They revel in dog whistles and culture wars against minorities. We've got a UK government that's clamping down on the right to protest, clamping down on the right to strike, clamping down on your ability to vote. I wasn't being an alarmist when I mentioned the F word because the alarm bells are ringing louder than they ever have before. We're in the midst of a cost of greed crisis that shows no sign of slowing. We've got food prices rising, rents and mortgages continuing to rise, and yet wages never do. Living standards continue to decline to the point that baby formula is now kept behind the counter in many places to prevent mothers stealing it. What an indictment of the society that we live in right now. For many people, this is undoubtedly the scariest political period they have ever experienced. And with all these reasons in mind, I mean, it's, it's no wonder that support for independence is at the highest that it has been in a long time. But it's with all these reasons in mind that I also found myself initially questioning, why isn't it go flying through the roof? What more has to happen? What more does Westminster have to do against Scotland's interests before people see how bad the situation is? And then it hit me that the reason is actually all of those things that I have just mentioned. Most folk are too busy worrying about where their next meal is coming from or how they're going to pay their next bill to be able to give Scotland's constitutional future the time it deserves. And that's where the job is on us. We have to speak to people where they're at right now. We have to reach out to people to where they are. And we have to explain to them that independence is not an emotional choice, it's not an emotional decision, it's a logical one. It is the only logical decision. If Scotland was already independent and we were being asked 
Do you want to join Westminster? Do you want to join the United Kingdom? What would the selling point be? <laughs> we have suffered decades of unelected Tory governments deciding the economic policy of Scotland. We have a Labour Party in opposition that's too busy with their pound shop Blair Tribute Act to do much opposing. <laughs> and just take the biggest elephant in the room as an example. We know that Brexit is breaking Britain and yet Labour still support it. They still claim we'll make it work, but they won't tell you how they'll make it work. Their deathly silence proves that just like the Tories, they hope that if they ignore stuff long enough, it will just go away. Well, Scotland deserves better than what Sir Starmer is offering. It is the same old tired myths and the same old tired arguments that are being rehashed by Labour. As part of this union, we have to remind people that Scotland's only voice within this system is to have 59 MPs out of 650, and they're looking to cut that down even further. But just to put that into context, where Scotland has 59 MPs, the city of London has 73. So we're in a situation where one city can, and regularly does, outvote the second largest nation in this union. Even the courts have confirmed that we are not in a union of equals. The only way to ensure that Scotland gets away from Brexit, gets away from austerity, and gets away from UK governments that we do not vote for is to have the powers of a normal, independent country. <laughs> now, I'm really proud of the record of our Scottish government, and there will be a lot of people who tell you that we shouldn't be. But when I look at what the Scottish government has done, all I see is a government that's elected for a start, but we have used all of the tools at our disposal to mitigate Westminster damage everywhere we can, wherever it's possible. We've paved a different style and a different path based on fairness and dignity wherever possible. Just this morning, we seen it in action. We had Hamza, our First Minister, stop mid-speech to go down and listen to and comfort someone who was in distress. Do you think you'd see Rishi doing that? We literally spend millions and millions of pounds every year trying to protect people from policies that they never voted for in the first place. So we have to help people imagine what more good we could do if we were able to better spend that money without one hand tied behind our backs. We have to communicate the importance of investing in and controlling and managing our own natural resources so that we don't see history repeat itself and watch our great assets being squandered. We have to help people question whether this is truly the best that Scotland can be. Because frankly, our current setup is unsustainable. We've seen that with things like the Internal Market Act and everything that the UK government's trying to do just now. They will undermine the devolved parliaments at every given opportunity and deny that they're doing it at all. So what we have to do is help people reevaluate the definition of broad shoulders. And when the penny drops, we have to be there to offer them a greater vision of what's possible. We have to show them that the answer to a lot of the problems in folks' lives right now lie with getting the governments you vote for. It's only with mass public support that our independence is going to have legitimacy at home and internationally. Because ultimately, we have to be frank with ourselves, if other countries don't view us as independent, then we are not yet independent. So legitimacy has to be at the heart of everything we do, and only the public 
can give us that legitimacy. Now, I've made no secret of my feelings towards Westminster over the years. My disdain for its attitudes, for its culture, for how it functions, and the lack of uh, central heating and any kind of air conditioning <laughs> also is problematic. But actually, it reminds me of a timely story one of the doorkeepers told me in 2015 when I first arrived. And for those of you who don't know, the doorkeepers are the ones with the, the white bow ties and the long tailcoats. They keep everybody safe, they keep Parliament up and running, make sure everything's okay. They're essentially really well-dressed jannies. <laughs> but they're great people. <laughs> and one of these doorkeepers uh, took me into one of the voting lobbies uh, that's beside the chamber in the Commons. And he showed me this big vintage leather desk that sits bang in the middle. And it was there that they told me that when Winnie Ewing was elected and when she first arrived at Westminster, she wasn't given an office. Nobody gave her an office. Now, if I thought Westminster is bad now or was bad eight years ago, then I can only imagine what it must have been like over 50 years ago when Winnie was there. But to be honest, I thought to myself, you know, this isn't much of a surprise because even in my own experience, you don't get given an office right away. You have to wait a few weeks so that things can get organized. But the doorkeeper explained that this was very different for Winnie because she was made to wait much longer than a few weeks. Months and months went by and she would chase it up, but she would always either be ignored or dismissed. So one day, when he took all her stuff, she walked into that very voting lobby, to that big desk, and she planked her stuff down, and she said, if you won't give me an office, then I'll make this one my office. <laughs> now, to be clear, th these voting lobbies are not quiet places. They're pretty busy. They're filled with people walking through them throughout the day, folk plotting and chatting to one another. And they routinely fill up with hundreds of MPs whenever there's a vote, which obviously happens pretty often. Now, I hope the doorkeeper wasn't at it when they told me this story, because I share it with you not just as a tribute to the late and great Winnie Ewing, but also because, for me, it encapsulates what her victory meant to so many people what it symbolizes about this party and about the independence movement as a whole. Because in many ways, it's arguably an analogy of where we are right now, being ignored and disrespected by Westminster, watching lots and lots of very entitled people scoff and look down their noses at us and what we're trying to do. Now, when we are there, Westminster is a different place. And I want to say that as we head towards the general election, there is nothing that Westminster would like more than to see the SNP vanish from the Commons. Because when we're there, they are held to account in ways that they never have been. When we are there, we're a thorn in the side of any Prime Minister's government. And there have been a few <laughs> in recent years. Let's not forget, it was Ian Blackford who called out Boris Johnson as a liar long before Westminster did. And he was thrown out. Now, as appalling as it was that Ian was thrown out of the Commons for stating the truth, we also can't forget that Westminster eventually, reluctantly dragging its heels, admitted to be true the very fact they originally chastised us for. So when the Tories and Labour walk through the lobbies together to back, back Brexit, we are there to stand against it. When they both vote through austerity, we are there to stand against it. When they both stuff the unelected House of Lords with their pals and their cronies and whoever else is in their WhatsApp chats, we are there to stand against it. And when they continually ignore the democratic will of the devolved parliaments, we are there to stand against it. Because the only reason more folk are wakening up 
to the potential that independence gives us is because they are seeing us highlight how powerless Scotland truly is as part of this union. Because of us being there in Westminster, we are able to drag them to the dispatch box to publicly justify themselves, to justify the damage that they are inflicting on Scotland. And this is crucial because as somebody said earlier on, the world is watching. Let me assure you, the response that we got and get from our international colleagues is very different to what it was when I first arrived in 2015. They are watching the UK tailspin and they see how Scotland continually strives to take another path, continually strives to take a logical path and a fair path. There is a reason that James Cleverly wants to stop the SNP talking to any other countries and that's because they are listening. They see how democracy is being undermined. But most importantly, they see the fact that every unionist wants us to forget or not notice. They see that no unionist can answer the question, how do you leave this voluntary union? How do you leave it democratically? Because the truth is, they don't have an answer. They don't have one that will stand up to any scrutiny whatsoever. And that's why the main tool in the unionist arsenal right now is the, to hope that we get tired. That's all they have left, is to hope that we will fight amongst ourselves and chuck it and give up. Now, I've no doubt that many in here probably do feel tired, but I also have no doubt that Winnie Ewing felt tired all those years ago, sat in that lobby being bullied by an establishment. When we say things like, we stand on the shoulders of giants. It's not a, a platitude, it's fact. The only reason we are where we are is because of all of you. It's for the generations of people that have come before us constantly refusing to give up. The generations of people who have gone out and spoken to people, chapped on doors, had human conversations with their friends, with their family, in the staff rooms, wherever it is people who are able to form conversations based off of what is it that's bothering you? What is it that's stopping you stepping towards independence? Let's start there and see if we can convince you. Every person in this movement plays a part in pushing us forward. No matter how hopeless things have appeared, we have always been there carrying on and pushing forward the cause. The idea of independence has grown across generations because it's not about any one individual. It's about all of us doing what we can. So before I finish, I want to leave you with a, a statistic that Westminster can actually be proud of. I know it's ironic, but uh, this is one that they should wear a badge of honor for. According to the Guinness World Book of Records, the UK is the country from which most countries have gained independence. Since 1939, 62 countries have gained independence from Westminster, and not a single one has ever asked to come back. So we do what those before us have taught us. We pick ourselves up, we dust ourselves off, and we keep chapping doors and winning hearts and minds one at a time, because if we do that, Scotland will be the 63rd country, of that I have no doubt. <laughs> now, in politics, much like life, people come and people go. Issues change, life happens, and amongst all the politics. But what remains consistent across all of these generations is that folk give what they can, when they can, however they can, and every single bit of it counts. There were those who thought that 2014 was the end for us, and yet here we are, 
in 2023, nearly 10 years on, with more support than we had then. Our electoral success as a party has ensured that independence stays on the agenda, no matter who is in number 10. Independence is no longer seen as a ridiculous fringe idea. Now, it's undoubtedly a mainstream idea. It's a mainstream political thought in Scotland. And it's not because of any one person or politician, but it's because of all of us. And even just today, we've heard some of the excellent ideas. And the last thing I would leave you with is that for me, certainly, even just as deputy leader of the Westminster Group, for me today has been primarily a listening exercise for us in the leadership of this party. It's obvious that we have a job to do, not just out there in the streets, but for you, we have a job to do. We have to learn from the mistakes of the past and embrace what works. We need to make sure that we have a headquarters that is organized, a headquarters that supports its members, that embraces our members. We should strive to provide better support and communication to our membership. We have to equip you with the tools to get out on the street. We have to con convince you to get out there to convince others. And the only way we can do that is to make sure that we provide you with the arguments you need, to give you the confidence you need to take the case out there to other folk. Ultimately, in order for us to feel confident and energized, we all have to pull together and we all have a role to play. But let me tell you this, after nearly 10 years being down at Westminster, together I have absolutely no doubt that we are closer to independence than we ever have been before. And together we're gonna win it. Thank you. Welcome to the stage uh, to give the closing speech for today, our Deputy First Minister, Shona Robison, MSP. Friends, you'll be glad to hear that I'm going to be very brief because this has been a very long and a very hot day here in Sun City. Uh, but I know it's been a very productive day and I want to give a couple of thank yous first of all. First of all, a thank you to conference organisers, headquarters staff, the wonderful staff at the Caird Hall who have kept us all safe and looked after. Thank you to them. And a big thank you to all of you, all of you who have come here to the great city of Dundee and many of whom have spoken in what has been a tremendous event. And I, can't think, friends, of a better place to have had this uh, convention. Because when uh, Dundonians were asked if they wanted Scotland to be an independent country, they didn't just say yes, they said yes more than any other part of Scotland. And that makes me extremely <laughs> proud of my city. And it's that Dundee yes spirit that we must harness as we move forward. Independence must and will be front and centre of our general election campaign. It's now more urgent than ever that people have the positive alternative of becoming a normal independent country. And by the way, friends, we know it's inevitable because when you look at the support for independence among those under 40, it is huge, consistent, because they see it as a normal state of affairs. They're confident and comfortable about who they are. For them, independence is normal. That makes it inevitable. But it's our job to finish the job. I've been a, 
I've been a member of this party for 35 years. Hard to believe, I know, eh? Just a bairn when I join. And I, I can tell you that journey from where we used to, at best, sometimes come a good second to now having run the Scottish Government, the government of our country for 16 years, and we are that close to independence. And it's our collective job to finish that journey. And that, friends, is what we will do. be it for me to, to say that Dundonians always know best, but I think as we move forward, we must make it our mission to spread that Dundee Yes spirit into every single part of our wonderful country. Our task is to leave no one in doubt about the nature and strength of Scottish opinion. The discussions that have taken place today, both on and off the stage, have undoubtedly helped us to shape how we do that. Our First Minister has outlined a way for us to provide people with a democratic route to have their say over their future and break that Westminster intransigence with the power of the people. So let's go from here, friends. Let's go from here. Let's go back to all of our constituencies and our communities. Let's make sure that we work twice as hard towards that general election campaign and let's make sure that we finish the job that so many others started, the Winnie Ewings, the Margaret Ewings, the fantastic people of our party that unfortunately are not going to see that day. And to be honest, that breaks my heart, but it makes me even more determined for them and for our next generation to do the job and make sure that Scotland can be all she can be with independence. Take care, safe journey home. Thank you.